Sorry to have to uh, cut that off early. Um, the reason was that I didn't have these picture six images ready to go, and so I had to set them up on my system first. But in any case, uh, now we can begin again and begin with uh, picture six. So I'm reading from The Mystery of the Conjunctio, Alchemical Image of Individuation uh, by Edward F. Edinger. And Dr. Edinger was one of the leading Jungian analysts of the late 20th century. He died in 1998. Um, <clears throat> but he wrote many influential books, I think 17 in total. And uh, the ones that I like the best are the ones that are actually lectures that he gave. So this is one of those books. And so, okay, uh, Buzz, can you see my email address now? Uh, I know you asked for it. It should be right above where you said, welcome back. Um, and if not, I'll put it on again. It's skip.conover at gmail.com. And so if you write to me, uh, you can reach me there. Okay. Picture number six, in the tomb. Things have become radically simplified. There is a mortuary slab with a united dead body on it, and that's all there is. I would remind you that this follows the picture I consider to be the revelation of the mystery. From that way of looking at it, this shows the effect of witnessing what happened in picture five. It literally strikes one dead. Now, there are many different ways this can be considered, but the one I want to pay particular attention to, especially in terms of my earlier remarks about the opposites, is that picture five and six, pictures five and six, represent a consequence of seeing into the dynamism of the opposites. Once you really see how that works, you are knocked out by it, so to speak. You're suddenly ejected from the life process that has kept you going, and the shock has the effect of a kind of psychological death. Once you see behind the operation of the opposites, you're not their victim anymore, but at the same time, you lose connection with the energy that propelled you through life. So it's an insight that can literally kill. It's an image of what happens when one encounters a standpoint beyond the opposites, and a profound wound, possibly fatal, is inflicted upon the ego. Because when the opposites are united, and when one sees behind the mechanism of the opposites, then the dynamo of the psyche is broken. At least the dynamo of the ego is broken. Then there's no energy gradient between the poles to maintain a flow of life. The opposites have canceled each other out. In terms of typical alchemical symbolism, this is an image of the mortificatio. Very few, alch very few alchemical operations regularly follow one another. There is, as a rule, no strict sequence, but there is a certain regularity to conjunctio being followed by mortificatio. If the conjunctio is not the ultimate one that totally ends the process, if it's, at, if it's an intermediate or lesser conjunctio, then it is regularly followed by mortificatio, and that's what takes place in this picture series. And just so we're clear, I'll put the other image up that comes with this particular picture, just so you can see it. Uh, that's the picture of the mortificatio uh, from the Rosarium. Um, and so, uh, 
Okay, everybody's happy to be back now, I suppose. Um, you can see a lot of examples of that if you look around. It's the theme of marriage and death. Marriage being followed by death, or someone being married to death, or a linkage of the two one way or another. It is an expression of this archetypal sequence of conjunctio, followed by mortificatio. Then, for instance, of Tristan and Isolde, Romeo and Juliet, one can almost say, archetypically speaking, that it is the typical fate of the lover to die. So if one is a lover, one had better disidentify from the condition somewhere along the line or risk becoming a fatality. Another way of seeing picture six is that it represents the death of the ego upon encounter with the self. This is the sort of thing that can happen if the ego is completely identified with one side of a pair of opposites. Then, when the union takes place, the ego experiences the fate of the united opposites. The opposites die in the course of giving birth to the higher totality and transcends them. And if the ego is identified with one of those parts, it will share that death experience. Oscar Wilde once observed that there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and that's getting it. You lived out this sequence in, he lived out this sequence in his personal life, as you may know, and his defeat resulted in a considerable deepening of his psychology. Picture six shows us what happens after one has united with the object that carries the projection of desire, providing consciousness arrives on the scene. As I said before, very often there's a short circuit and the first five pictures repeat themselves. But if consciousness enters the picture, then when one gets what one wants, one discovers that it isn't what one wanted. Hence the sense of dissolution and death. And of course, um, all of you are familiar with this image. This is never enough. So this individual got what he wanted, <laughs> namely a 64, 63 foot motor yacht. <laughs> and um, because he got it, he had to go on to something else to want. And that, that started the process again for that individual too bad, but that's what happens in with materialism. So, so let me go on. Question, what is left after the breakdown of projection? There's nothing left temporarily. If one's life has resided in a particular external object, and then that life, that energy, leaves the object, then nothing is left of that connection. But then the missing life has to be located, and it's rediscovered within. The projection has a chance to be integrated. In certain texts, the alchemists state that death is the conception of the philosopher's stone. It's a necessary beginning to the process that the development of the philosopher's stone represents. In picture 10, if picture 10 can be called a picture of the philosopher's stone, then picture 6 is its conception the first step. And the word conceptio is written above picture 6. Righto. Okay. Here's what Jung says about the psychology of this event. The integration of contents that were always unconscious and projected involves a serious lesion of the ego. Alchemy expresses this through the symbols of death, mutilation, or poisoning. And that is what is represented in picture six. So the encounter of the smaller entity, the ego, with the self, 
evokes a damage that borders on the fatal. I think it's very f similar to what happens when a primitive society encounters a more highly developed society. Let's consider a little further the aspects of mortificatio symbolism. I'll give you a couple of alchemical texts that refer to this. First, for the flavor, quote, O happy gate of blackness, cries the sage, which art the passage to this so glorious change. Study, therefore, whosoever appliest himself to this art, only to know this secret. For to know this is to know all, but to be ignorant of this is to be ignorant of all. Pure, pure putrefaction precedes the generation of every new form into existence. They seem to be popular today. Okay. All right. Two more pages. Putrefaction is one aspect of mortificatio. It's just one step further. You die and then you rot. Here's what one alchemical text says about it. Quote, Putrefaction is of so great efficacy that it blots out the old nature and transmutes everything into another new nature and bears another new fruit. All living things die in it. All dead things decay and then all these dead things regain life. Putrefaction takes away the acridity from all corrosive spirits of salt, renders them soft and sweet. That's paradoxical thinking. The idea is that putrefaction, which stinks and is foul, brings about sweet and soft consequences. Most frequently in the text, it is the king or Saul that undergoes mortificatio. In the Rosarium sequence, it is Saul and Luna simultaneously. For a man, Saul would represent the archetypal principle of ego functioning, and Luna would represent the same for a woman. It's that kind of egocentricity that must be mortified at, this, at a certain stage. Jung says, for, for instance, Jung says, for instance, Egocentricity is a necessary attribute of consciousness and is also its specific sin. And mortificatio is the eventual punishment of that sin. Okay, so if I go back here just for a moment, again to my favorite picture. Okay, so for whoever this is, um, this was a, a vision that this person wanted to get. He got it, and now it's sitting there rotting at the dock. And But then maybe he got a different projection, and that different projection might be that he meets a young woman that he'd like to take out on this yacht. And so he... Uh, he goes after her and hopefully brings her onto the yacht. But if he doesn't get another desire that he's going to chase, um, then it, then the yacht, the Never Enough, is going to just um, rot at the dock. And that'll be the end. That's mortificatio. And so, um, okay. So... So how, how many times have you wished you could get something and know you can't? Um, I am now at two minutes after four, so I have now passed all chance of appealing in my lawsuit. And so that lawsuit is over. And uh, if I had succeeded with my lawsuit, I would have gotten something I wanted but I didn't, and uh, lo and behold, I'm still going to get something I want. So um, I'll be talking about that more in the next few weeks, um, but um, if you get what you want, it 
uh, is also not good necessarily. Okay. So, so anyway, as Jung says, Jung says, for instance, quote, egocentricity is a necessary attribute of consciousness and is also its specific sin, unquote. He says that in Mysterium. And mortificatio is the eventual punishment of that sin. How would this image show up in the various modes we've spoken of? In an individual, it would picture the situation where the ego has been united with the desired object and then experiences disillusionment. It would follow not just any old event, but rather some crucial experience coming at a time when a new level of consciousness was ready to emerge. Then, after getting what one thought one wanted, to discover that one has been seeking the wrong thing all along has the effect of a revelation. Or it can be an image of just the opposite, of failing to get what one wanted or being frustrated. And because, of the, time, because the time is right, one does not just drop the issue and go hunting in greener pastures, but chooses or is obliged to endure to the bitter full the frustration of not getting what one thought one wanted. In that process, the de in that process of defeat and mortificatio, one then makes the transition to another level of awareness. And uh, just in in the context of what happens in our political life right now. Um, you know, our president wanted to be president, but do, do you think that he um, is happy once he became president? Uh, I would suggest probably not. At the same time, um, the mortificatio as it affects Hillary Clinton uh, also um, is mortificatio, but in defeat and therefore she's gone to another level of awareness. Um, and perhaps after today, uh, January 25th, 2019, uh, the president has moved up to a new level of awareness as well. Uh, you have to be careful what you wish for. You see, either way, it's an experience of defeat. If you get what you wanted, and discover you didn't want it after all, that's every bit as much of a defeat as not getting it. In some respects, it's worse because you did it yourself. <laughs> uh, in terms of a relationship, we can think of it as representing two people who have merged psychologically in ways I've talked about earlier, who in the course of that merging lose their separate identities and then discover that fact. If you don't realize what's happened, you don't get past picture five. But if you do discover the fact that in your dependent merging into the state of participation mystique with your partner, you've lost your identity, then that's experienced as a death. It's a death that's already happened, but it doesn't register until one becomes aware of it. You see, but it doesn't register until one becomes aware of it, you see. It only becomes a disaster when it's discovered, but the discovery of it then allows the process to continue. And this next stage represented in pictures seven through 10 to occur. Okay, so um, again, if we put up the juxtaposition between the president and the speaker of the house, um, they both lost their independent existence because they're uh, in this opposing relationship and maybe they don't realize that they're in participation mystique but they definitely are and so now and once they realize it then they can move on to the next levels of consciousness 
If they don't realize it, then they're going to drop back and go through the cycle again until they do realize it. Okay. If we consider picture six as representing a process in a collective, then we might say that the war between the two factions is over. It took place in picture five and it's finished. The issue is decided. Presumably both are exhausted, one in victory and one in defeat. And the same issues will apply if the process isn't to be short-circuited. You may have noticed in the history of nations that often the nation defeated in war later rises to a higher level of collective de development than the victorious one. At any rate, the experience of defeat must also take place in the collectivity in order for this image to emerge. Naturally, it will take place more readily with the faction that has been defeated, but it can also take place in the victorious nation. For instance, if it's been a Pyrrhic victory, or the awareness dawns that the war wasn't worth fighting after all. However, from this point on, I don't feel able to pursue this sequence of pictures further in terms of the collective process. Maybe somebody else can do it, but from here on, I'm only able to interpret it as a process within an individual. I believe collective or dual interpretations peter out with picture six, and if anyone disagrees with me, I'll be happy to listen. Well, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Edinger uh, died in 1998, as I said, so it's a little too late for me to suggest to him that perhaps uh, the next four pictures are also relevant to uh, these types of issues. Now picture six is not at all an uncommon image in dreams, the image of the death of some figure, and that would represent a process of transformation. I always understand death in dreams as being part of a larger theme of death and rebirth, and if the rebirth isn't evident in one dream, it will almost always show up sooner or later in a future one. But of course, the image has the greatest impact when, it, when it's the dreamer who has the experience of dying. That's not so common, but it's not rare either. And in my experience, it never means literal death. Rather, it means a very sizable attitudinal change, sizable enough for the unconscious to express it in terms of death. The old ego and its governing principles are being modified or altered to such an extent that it's felt to be an actual death. And so I just point out to you that in the Tarot cards, uh, I believe it's the number 15 card is death. And when you get the death card in a reading, it doesn't mean physical death. It means a change is going to come. And so we'll go on. Question. Could you comment on the hermaphroditic quality of the inert being in figure six? Okay, let me put figure six back up on the screen. Oops. That is not the right one. Okay, so the question is, could you comment on the hermaphroditic quality of the inert being in picture six? I can reiterate something Jung says on the subject, which is that in actual clinical material in his experience, and the same thing applies to my own experience, the image of the hermaphrodite is not an image of the final product. It is rather an image of the original composite mixture the prima materia that needs to undergo differentiation. Okay, so when you have a hermaphrodite in your dream, it means something has to be differentiated from something else. So that is the end of picture six from this book, and I've been reading from The Mystery of the Conjunctio, Alchemical Image of Individuation, and we have been through picture six. 
So tomorrow I will read um, picture seven, which is separation of soul and body at some point. I don't know when I'll do it exactly tomorrow. And uh, so then um, Buzz says, have you ever thought that never is an object? So when he finds never, it may be enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that, <clears throat> that's <clears throat> that's a good and clever comment, but uh, it it obviously isn't enough because he's not there, so he's out chasing some other projection, whatever that mean may be, maybe maybe it's a bigger boat, it might be a girl, and he might have moved his projection over to a Maserati or something like that. Who knows? Uh, but <laughs> this is a good comment. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So I'm going to move on. And uh, my bride has arrived home from work. So I'm going to join her for the evening. And uh, I will see you probably tomorrow to do picture seven. And ultimately, the objective is in the next four days to have all 10 and this whole book read into the channel so that then you can read through it um, in an organized way, let's say. Uh, and then I'll make a, a playlist about it, I suppose. So anyway, thank you for joining me today. Martin says, I was reflecting on image one and saw the four stars in each corner of the square it may it made me think of the four personality groups sj sp and and so he's talking about this image which is the mandala fountain and so the stars in the corners and it's a quaternity so it made me think of the four personality groups sj sp and t and f and the archetypal presence of the type and you're quite right, Martin. Uh, it does refer to that. Um, <clears throat> and, and all alchemy um, is about quaternity. And um, I'm not sure. Oh, no, I can't bring it up here. Um, well, maybe I can. OK, there's a. Um, there's an image that is in the end of Ion, uh, which I will have to chase down here for a moment. Um, but we were using it yesterday in the advanced reading group. And so let me see if I can find it quickly here. Um, because this image shows uh, four categories of four and it sort of sums up alchemy at some level. And so if I can find it quickly, um, let's see, is that figure? Yes. OK. OK, so this is the figure. And um, as you see, um, you have, uh, oops, it's not quite all visible there, so let me make that a little smaller so that I can get the whole thing on. Okay, so there's four levels of alchemical work, and um, so in the right-hand column here, you have reference to the psychological types. And because you have the, um, um, the sense perception, which is the S, the intellectual discrimination, uh, which is the N, the reason, which is the T, and the arcanum is the F, which um, also would be called Eros, I believe. And um, you need all four. And so when the alchemists were working on these quaternities, um, 
this is how they were thinking about it. And mind you, when they're referring to elements here, they're not talking about um, uh, the periodic table. They're talking about elements in a psychological, from a psychological point of view, which is how early Iron Maid age men and women who were thinking about these things envisioned it. And of course, when we got the scientific method, um, the alchemists were working from the second or third century, and we got this scientific method at about the beginning of the 16th century. So for all that time, uh, the alchemists were working on this basis, and then from the 16th century, we started to get um, people dividing up the periodic table in the way that we're familiar with it in the 21st century. Um, and uh, Buzz says, thank you, please pass my best to your better half. I certainly will. And Martin, I also see the four archetypes of the mature masculine king, warrior, magician, lover. Yes, absolutely. Those archetypes are present. And uh, they also do relate to the cognitive functions, absolutely. Um, so you're quite right. So I have a lot of very knowledgeable followers now. I'm pleased that you're here and and uh, pushing me along. It makes me it makes me try to be sharper, I guess. But says Martin, the Tao Te Ching, I think, says where war has happened, ten years of famine follow. The feminine seek to feed children and are thus the creative principle. Well, um, yep, the feminine side is always the creative principle, but yes, um, you, you get this cycle where um, you're, everything is destroyed <laughs> thanks to your war based on tea. Okay, and then you go and uh, find things with your S uh, based on being hungry and starving because you've destroyed your society. And then through intuition, you see the things that you can use, the N, and then through the uh, F, the feeling function, um, you can begin to create a new which is the feminine side of what you're talking about. Uh, so I hate to wrap it up, but um, we have a, a good audience today. But I will endeavor to get online tomorrow and do the next picture in this series of 10. And so this is, again, I've been reading from The Mystery of the Conjunctio, Alchemical Image of Individuation. And the image that's on the screen right now is about ion uh, researches into the phenomenology of the self. And this coming Wednesday, we will be completing our about eight month seminar on ion. So there are, will be 32 uh, separate sessions. All of them have been video recorded and they are in our advanced reading group so if you cho choose to join our advanced reading group you can go uh, to those uh, immediately and and work through the seminar uh, you won't be live of course but we did uh, video record them and then uh, a week from mon uh, a week from Wednesday um, we will begin uh, with Mysterium Conjunctionis, and that's going to be a major task, which I estimate to take at least a year, at least a year. Um, and meanwhile, in the general reading room uh, on Monday nights at 8 p.m., we are uh, going to be working through psychology and alchemy, since that's really a history of the development of the Western psyche. Uh, from about 1500 BC uh, to current times. 
and uh, so just to give you an order of magnitude as of last monday we got through the first 10 <laughs> paragraphs and there's 555 paragraphs and this coming monday night there's two paragraphs that are extremely important and these are paragraphs 11 and 12 in um, volume 12 of the collected works of cg young and uh, so you can find that in the Dropbox, and this is just two facing pages, but these two pages are so complex that I anticipate we won't get through all of those two pages in, those, in that two-hour period, Monday night at 8. Uh, and, of course, ION is volume 9, 2, two small i. Uh, eyes um, in the in the volume number so ion is volume 92 psychology and alchemy is volume 12 and um, mm. mysterium conjunctionis is volume 14 uh, so anyway mm -hmm. peace um, thank you for joining and we'll uh, see you next time